Please join with me in a word of prayer. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, God who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, over the broken glass of our world, the rumors meant to hurt, the prejudice meant to wound, the weapons meant to kill. Right on. Trampling our attempts at disaster into dust. Right on. Right on in majesty. Over the distance which separates us from you, and it is such a distance, measurable in half-truths, in unkept promises, in second-best obedience, right on, until you teach and heal us, who feel for no one but ourselves, right on, right, right on, on in majesty, through the back streets and the sin bins, and the sniggered at corners of the city where human life festers and love runs cold, right on. Bringing hope and dignity where most send scorn and silence, right on. Right on in majesty. For you, O Christ, you care and must show us how. On our own, our ambitions rival your summons and thus threaten good faith and neglect God's people. In your company and at your side, we might yet help to bandage and heal the wounds of the world. Ride on. Ride on in majesty and take us with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We are all on a journey. The question is always, which journey are we on? And are we really present on that journey? Or are we always thinking of another excursion, one that seems different, more exciting, more fun, more interesting than the one we are on? When I was a child, the county fair was a big deal. As a matter of fact, it was so big, school let out through the entire school system for the first day of the fair. And of course, the first day of the fair, they had a parade. You had to go to the parade, and then everybody would head to the fairgrounds to see and ride the amusement park rides, to see the biggest squash someone could grow or the biggest pumpkin of the year. You had to see the brilliant dahlias and lilies or the homemade watercolors that grandma made. You had to judge for yourself the fine fat pigs and whether or not that cow was indeed the finest of show. But the fair, as fun and wonderful as it was, you knew it would be there for a week. But the parade, the parade you only had for an hour or two. In my youngest years, it seemed to me that that parade in Roswell, New Mexico had to be the biggest parade in the world. Marching bands with loud music that I'd cover my ears to. Big clowns on the smallest of bikes. And in New Mexico, lots and lots of cowboys riding horses. Pretty girls sitting precariously on top of overly done uh, uh, floats and glittering floats. But the older I got, the more I watched television and saw the big city parade, you know, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and the Rose Bowl Parade, and, and somehow 
the southeastern New Mexico State Fair Parade seemed to get dimmer and dimmer and less glamorous. It's a natural human trait, it seems, for us to always think there's a better parade someplace else that we ought to be a part of. It's that grass is always greener on the other side of the fence syndrome. But the parade that we celebrate every year on Palm Sunday, that we commemorate on this day, is a very, very different kind of parade. It has less to do with festivity. It's not meant to entertain us. The parade in which Jesus participated, he being the only float uh, in that parade, was more of a moment on a journey. And not a journey to a fair or a football game or a big party. It was a journey, a parade into the depths of meaning, honest, raw, rugged meaning about who we are as human beings. And it begs the question, in which parade are you going to march? What parade will you cheer at this year? Will it be the one with the glitz and the glamour? Or will it be the one that takes you into that deep place inside? Marcus Borg and John Dominic Poisson have explored the fact that this Palm Sunday moment cannot be understood without putting it in its historical context. That you must understand that across the city of Jerusalem, from this parade, this, um, this march into Jerusalem, was another parade that began this religious festival. Another procession was taking place. It happened every time a lot of religious people gathered in one place. This was the one led by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of the region with his imperial cavalry and soldiers bursting with pomp and circumstance, noise and authority. The intention of Pilate's parade was to force the throngs of devoted and faithful to cower next to his power, to compel them into behaving or risk the strong retaliation of his mighty forces. Jesus' parade was entirely different. By entering humbly on a colt, he garnered not just the attention, but the respect, the admiration, shall I say, the, the discipleship of the masses. Because you see, he saw the people on the sides of the road as companions on the journey, not enemies that needed to be subdued like Pilate did. In fact, as the meditation that the choir and Colleen just read makes clear, Jesus knew the people, the people on the sides of the road, because he had walked over the broken glass of their world, to use the poem's terms. He had touched them and healed them. He had scoured the back streets and the corners of the city to bring hope and dignity to them, something Pilate would never do. Today we are asked, which journey will we be on? Which parade will we follow? The one that seeks dominance, glory, and success, but breeds fear and anguish? Or are we prepared? Are we prepared for a very different journey that will have very few accolades, but a whole lot of love, a whole lot of wasteful, extravagant love? Are we prepared for a journey that will acknowledge the hard places of life, but rather than making them worse, seek solidarity, companionship? offer advocacy and desires nothing but to heal the wounds of the world through humility 
and sacrifice and ultimately love. What parade will you cheer on this day? What journey are you on this week? I say ride on, ride on, ride on in majesty. Oh, Amen. But Jim, I need to do something special. My beloved congregation, I need to take a very special moment in the life of this church. This morning, I met with Larry Krell, Chair of the Board of Elders, and Larry, I would invite you to come forward. And I met with uh, David Muich, the Chair of the Official Church Board, and I shared with them this information that I share with you now. It is with mixed emotions, and yet an overwhelming sense of God's abiding presence that I inform you that I have been called as the regional minister of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the Capital Area. It is one of 33 regions of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I will conclude my ministry with you as your pastor in May. I shall begin my new ministry as regional minister there in June. This is the very same calling that led me to you. And it will be the very same calling to this new ministry as regional minister. I am tremendously proud of what we have done together here. Yet I am so filled with anticipation for what God has yet to do for you and with you in this dynamic, urban, diverse congregation, as well as what God can do through me to help the capital area. It has been an incredible journey for this beloved community and for me. Since April 16th of 2001, 14 years ago, when the region of Ohio encouraged the leaders of this congregation to call me as your redevelopment pastor. And then in 2004, when you reaffirmed that call as your established pastor, this congregation has been a transformed and transforming part of my life. Together, we have listened closely to the heartbeat of God. And we have been midwives to a new future for this 173-year young congregation. You offered me your trust. And you invited me into the most precious places of your lives. Births, dedications, baptisms, graduations, new jobs and lost jobs. You shared with me your addictions, your fears, your hopes, your failures and your successes, your marriages, your holy unions. You invited me into your homes and into your hospital rooms, your nursing homes. You even invited me to the jail cell where you were, and you invited me into the courtroom to testify for you. And you have invited me into the most intimate place of a human being's life to stand alongside you in the death and burial of your loved ones. I do not take that lightly. You have allowed me the profound privilege of teaching you, of making the word of God real for you in weekly preaching, serving alongside you, laughing with you, and then you offering the very same back to me. Each experience, each relationship has touched my life deeply and made me different and better because of it. You have made me a better pastor, a better preacher, a better administrator, a better teacher, a better person. And in doing so, you, my beloved, have prepared me to serve the broader church as a regional minister. I thank you for that gift. 
The Board of Elders and the officers of the church board with guidance and support from our regional minister in Ohio, the Reverend Dr. Bill Edwards, will help, will help ensure a strong future of this great congregation and will make sure that your vital ministry is sustained well into the future. I'm well aware that my departure will naturally bring up feelings. It does for me, certainly. Such occasions offer us opportunities to relate to and with each other in healthy ways in order to recognize this significant transition in the life of this congregation and to fully embrace God's future that is before us. My partner and husband, Craig Hoffman, will remain in Cleveland in his new job and in our Cleveland home for the foreseeable future. We, too, will be living a new chapter of our relationship as a bi-locational couple. Pray for us. I leave you with confidence, knowing that the smooth and solid transitions of leadership that we have experienced in recent years as well as the detailed and far-sighted visioning plan with which the official board is now working on top of the faithfulness of this amazing group of people is a solid foundation for the future of this congregation and the community around us. Because I believe the same Holy Spirit who leads us will sustain us. Thanks be to God for all good gifts. And thank you for this amazing ministry you have gifted me with.